riffs are too repetitive, the lyrics make no sense. All the songs are b-sides and the cover art's a mess. There's so much here to tear apart. Listen to it for a week, now that we has passed. Why I Hate This Album Podcast with Tim and Garrett. Hello and welcome to another episode of Why I Hate This Album. I am your host, Garrett Harvey. With me as always, co-host extraordinaire, Timothy Richardson. Tim, how are you? I am excited for Metallica. I too am very excited. That's right, we're doing Metallica's 2003 release, Saint Anger. Tim, did you hate this album? Garrett, I absolutely hated everything on this album. Everything? No, not everything. And I I should say, to start off with, not a huge Metallica fan, but I definitely don't hate the band as a whole. And okay, I, so it's I, it's not a corn situation. Right. You're not coming in angry. Right. They have terrible instincts, but I don't think there's another album of theirs that I think I just viscerally hate. But have you heard all of their albums? I haven't. But okay, of the, then. let's say, five that I've probably heard, don't hate any of them. There's bad parts. There's good parts. This is absolutely terrible, though. I hate it. Ouch. What about you? Do you hate this? Now, I'm not like you. I was a big metalhead as a kid. I love Metallica. Loved Metallica. Tim, there comes a time when a boy must set down childish things and pick up those of adulthood and face the honest reality that James Hetfield and Lars Ulrich, Kirk Hammett are a bunch of middle-aged dudes that are wildly insecure and make really, really bad music. Yeah, I hated this. I fucking hated this, dude. Yeah. This is really, really bad. You and I often are in a position where we have to guess how an album became such a flaming pile of dog shit. Not this time. This time, there's a guide. There is a two-hour-plus documentary called Some Kind of Monster. It's on Netflix that chronicles the entire implosion of this band and the creation simultaneously of this album. Usually, you and I say, this is a studio-forced album. You can tell it's entirely commercial and the band wasn't in it from the start. And we're guessing. We don't know. Maybe they're just wildly untalented. Not this time. This time, we know they had a date on the calendar three years before they ever even started writing a word. Yes, It should be said, though, that the documentary is easily as good as this album is bad. It is a... That documentary is phenomenal. Yeah, it's a bizarro version of Spinal Tap, but real. Yes, 100% real. If you enjoy Curb Your Enthusiasm, but you're like, I don't know, it's just not awkward enough. (laughs) Go watch Some Kind of Monster, for the love of God. Hopefully when you finish this episode of the podcast, you're so intrigued by the bizarre and sad little animal that is this album, that you will go watch this movie. It's so good. I can't recommend it enough. The album, please don't listen to it. It's terrible. But you'll hear some parts on the on the on the documentary, so that's that's plenty. More than enough. Too much. But let's take a step back. We're getting too much into this. Let's go back to the beginning. Tim, as a young chap, were you ever exposed to the Metallica? Did Metallica expose itself to you? Metallica on several occasions did in fact expose itself to me. I don't poor have boy. a ton of history with this band. I had individual songs from earlier albums on Burn CDs. And weirdly, Metallica has this strange place in my memory. For a long time, I thought I hated live music because in the mid-90s, I had some really poor quality, non-soundboard Metallica individual individual songs that sounded Felix. so terrible that I just I assumed that all live music was bad hmm. that it just it didn't come across unless it was in a studio but yeah I had a I had a fair amount of their early catalog mostly the hits Enter Sandman Unforgiven Nothing Else Matters one every it, one of those songs by the way really good yeah if you like heavy metal if you don't like heavy metal then they're you could still appreciate them but you're probably not gonna love them but they're very good this album though this came out just before i started my freshman year in college and i actually heard it once and i took an immediate dislike to it since then i've pretended it does not exist my roommate for the first two years of college loves metallica to the point, to this day yes to this day he finally convinced me after 15 years to go to a metallica concert with him last summer but that was i think his 33rd metallica concert wow. so he's basically the metallica equivalent of a deadhead so i was a fan of the first five and i'll even say five and a half 
albums. I was such a big fan, Tim, that this particular band holds a very special place in my heart. This is the first live concert I ever attended. Wow. August 5th, 1994. Dallas's Coca-Cola Starplex. It was the Shit Hits the Sheds tour. It's hard I to was say. Not, it, yeah, needlessly difficult. Doesn't really mean anything. I was not allowed to go. I was spending the night at Jeff Griffin's house, and luckily his father took us to the show. I made the mistake of purchasing a t-shirt while at the concert and doing a poor job of hiding it. Uh, Wearing it proudly. F- yes, exactly. Uh, my mother asked me, where'd you get the t-shirt? I made the claim that my friend got it for me, which she immediately saw through after I had already asked her if I could go to the Metallica concert, and she said no, and I was grounded for three weeks. <laughs> the history of Garrett's high school, middle school, etc., just, and and I was grounded for three weeks. Yeah, most of the time it does end, and then I was grounded. I'm the only person you've ever met who's been grounded while grounded, and I've been grounded for when I get ungrounded. It's like getting a penalty when you're already in the penalty box. <laughs> when you get done, get right back in there, sir. If my parents, if my room had had a room, Sometimes they make me go in the closet just because they couldn't send me to my room again. So what's crazy is in 1994, it's my first concert. I fucking love this band. By 1996, when Load comes out, first of all, I'm just like, cool, you got a bunch of blood and semen on your album. I'm kind of (laughs) out. Not me. Yeah, no, that's a Tim Magnet. And then when Reload came out a year later, which I now know was just they basically made a double LP and they took all the B-sides and threw it on Reload. But I was done taking Metallica's loads. I checked out after the first one and said, I'm I'm good. I don't need any more loads, Metallica. So had you not heard this album until this week? I heard it one time in um, probably 2000 and three when this documentary came out i then said well i gotta hear this album and listened to it and was like yep that that adds up <laughs> that, that is what i saw happen in that movie okay so that's how you and i came to this album kind of pretty much fresh as a daisy you'd heard a little i'd heard a little i was a huge fan as a child you less so but by and large kind of a clean slate for the for this cd is that fair yeah i think whenever this album came out i probably went into it expecting to like it boy yeah what you had the rug pulled out from you that day yep all right well let's talk a little bit about how metallica got here to really understand how it is you hit middle age and release arguably the worst album of your career we got to figure out how you got a career. Metallica was founded in 1981 in the L.A. general area whenever Lars Ulrich, their drummer, I believe he placed a newspaper ad looking for people to play with. James Hetfield, who would become their guitarist and main vocalist, bravely answered that call. They recruited Dave Mustaine for lead guitar in 82, and then they started playing around clubs in the L.A. area. And pretty early in their career, before they even released an album, they caught a huge break, and they became the opening act for British band Saxon on their 82 U.S. tour. We all remember Saxon. Yeah. Cliff Burton joined the band as the bassist, and I couldn't tell exactly. It's either 82 or 83. They decide to record their first album, which will be named Metal Up Your Ass. As Great you know, all, which I honestly should be a warning of things to come because that's where they were when they had good ideas. I'm going to defend metal up your ass because at least with that album, that is a bunch of kids who like heavy metal, play heavy metal and live that lifestyle. You and I know better than to name an album Metal Up Your Ass. But these kids are just like, no, man, it's metal straight up your ass. That's what we're calling it. (laughs) Right before the recording session was to begin, they kicked Dave Mustaine out for being a drunk. A Um, violent drunk. Yeah. And he will come back later. Not back into the band, obviously. So Kirk Hammett, he's kind of a butters. I called him the moist-eyed middle child of Metallica. He is a guitar virtuoso that doesn't want to fight and just wants to be told what to do. And is going to complain, but not loud enough for anyone to hear. You can't even call it passive-aggressive. It's mute-aggressive. <laughs> yeah. It's like a deaf guy screaming at you. <laughs> How about it, buddy? I don't give a shit. Uh, Mustaine would then <laughs> go on to form Megadeth in his period of shameful exile. I want to point something out really quickly so in 1983 they dumped mustaine 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 Mm -hmm. sure it's not mustaine i think it's pronounced like mustang i don't know all right it doesn't matter in 1983 they kick out dave mustaine just before they're about to record the album and in the same afternoon coincidentally they hire kirk hammett (laughs) what a convenient 
turn of events just before we record our first album, eh, guys? There's definitely some some fucked up dealings. That'll come back later. The label obviously refused to release something called Metal Up Your Ass, so they renamed it Kill 'Em All and released that in 1983. Uh, they really softened it, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. What if, we can't call it Metal Up Your Ass. All right, what about Kill 'Em All? Yeah, it, it <sighs> honestly. I don't it, feel like you guys understand the purpose of this <laughs> exercise. Yeah. Okay, so Kill 'Em All sells pretty slowly at first, but they start to build up a following relatively soon. They start playing larger venues, and within this time, they're actually playing borderline stadiums, I think. They release their second album, and they start having problems as a band right after their third album, Master of Puppets. Well, sure. breaks his wrist skateboarding for the first, but not the last time. <laughs> a guitar tech basically joins them to play all of his guitar parts for that tour. And then they go to tour in Sweden. While in Sweden, the tour bus rolls over and Cliff Burton, their bassist, was sleeping in Kirk Hammett's bunk and the tour bus rolled over and squished him. I believe that's the technical term. It did technically squish him. Yes, they began auditioning new bassists the day after the funeral. Yes, like immediately. They pick Jason Newstead, who... Correct. They then begin weirdly hazing. Allegedly, they make him record all of his bass parts for their fourth album, Injustice for All. But then they don't really put any of that on their final album, or maybe they have it so down in the mix that you basically can't hear any bass. That's weird. And they acknowledge this later on. From the moment that he joins the band, they treat him as like a contractor. They go out on tour again. Hetfield, of course, breaks his wrist skateboarding again. All right, so Cliff Burton dies. They hire Jason Newstead. Next comes two of their best albums to date. What is it? Justice for All and Metallica, and or as anyone who's ever bought a Metallica album knows it, the Black Album. Arguably their best easily my favorite. They tour on those two albums successfully. Wide stadium tours. Couldn't be more popular. And then comes Load. What is that? 1990... 96, I Loads guess Loads 96, Reloads 97. It is probably the last time that Metallica releases anything you could call innovative. Reload is, just as it sounds, a rehashing of Load that wasn't very good to begin with. And then comes 2000. Metallica doesn't release a single thing after 1997. They famously focus all of their energy on suing Napster after they realize they might be losing thousands of dollars on people downloading individual songs by the hundreds of of songs they likely already purchased on CD, but because iTunes isn't a thing yet, they're just trying to get a digital copy that isn't available anywhere. They win that suit. Everybody kind of hates them for it. Lars Ulrich bears the brunt of it, as he kind of should, because he's kind of comes off as a smarmy fuck. But he gets his because, you know, the internet becomes what it does. And all of those, <laughs> those dozens of downloads from Napster became hundreds of millions. And then comes 2001. Five plus years after their last album was released, they sit down to create something new. In the time that they have not been making music to him. You know what's happened, don't you? Disgusting new metal has weaseled its way into the this popular culture. And I think that that does play a role in this. Just wanted to drop that seed into your brain before I continue. They pick things back up and it's very clear from the documentary that all is not right in the land of Metallica. Lars Ulrich looks like he is constantly holding back a, a large scream. <laughs> or <laughs> And so in some are... places does not hold back a large scream. That's true. Eventually he does, in fact begins screaming horrifically, but he constantly looks like he wants to punch James Hetfield in the face. James Hetfield looks like he'd like to be doing anything but playing music, specifically drinking, I think, in this in the early parts of 2001. And Kirk Hammett looks like he's very distressed that everyone's not best friends. Yeah, he's just wet-eyed and wants everyone <laughs> to get along. Can't we just play music, guys? <laughs> well, no, because no, you haven't written any goddamn music. Well, that's not his job, but we'll get to that. <laughs> okay, so unfortunately, just as things are starting to heat up, they rent out an army barracks for some reason in San Francisco, and they set up a makeshift studio just after about two, two and a half months of recording utter garbage. James Hetfield's like, hmm, I got to go to rehab, guys, because I drink excessively. Well, small and point there. I don't think he actually tells anyone. I think he's just gone and they that's figured true. out from his wife or something. MTV News is where they learn oh. that information. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah, he doesn't tell anyone, much, much like everything else James Hetfield does prior to his stint in rehab. He just kind of goes and does it. And he goes um, the, for alcoholism and other addictions. That's banging ladies that aren't his wife. Oh. It's gotta be. I mean, why wouldn't it be? 
Uh, you're James Hetfield. You're a millionaire and the lead singer of Metallica. <laughs> if you're going to get another addiction besides alcohol, it should probably be banging ladies. <laughs> anyway, that's just my two cents, Tim. He can do what he wants. He's a grown man. <laughs> Hetfield's gone for 11 months, not your average 28 days later. And in that stead, the band doesn't know what to do. They don't know if they're still a band. Ulrich repeatedly wonders whether or not Hetfield even wants to come back to be a band. All of this chronicled, again, in the documentary. Can't recommend it enough. But then, finally, after 11 months, Hetfield returns. How do you think that went, Tim? Um, I believe he's going to come back pretty relaxed. He's going to be reinvigorated. He's going to have a lot of music written. It's going to go real well. Am right. I You're am super I right? close. Okay. You're super close. What we see come back is a timid, raw nerve of a human being forced to experience life without the aid of alcohol for the first time in 30 years. <laughs> so basically what I said. Yeah, yeah. And if that doesn't breed successful music, I don't know what does. So let me paint a scene. He's just returned. It's the eighth studio album. They're no longer in the army barracks. They are currently paying therapist Phil Towell $10,000 a week to meet with the band at all times, be in all recording sessions, and help monitor and help them work through their emotional issues. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, rock and, and roll. He does some pretty great things. Like he brings back their old guitarist, Dave sure Mustaine, do. who comes back and he, he wants to talk about how much it hurt him to be kicked out of the band, how people follow him around on the streets screaming how they hate him because he got kicked out of Metallica. Yeah, it's a weird, uh, weird yeah. reason to hate a guy. Yeah, it's also a weird move by your therapist. Mr. Towel's going to have, probably Dr. Towel, Phil, <laughs> let's call it Phil, has a lot of unconventional ideas, like writing lyrics for the band and handing them quietly to James Hetfield while he reads them and then turns his back on his therapist. Tim, this brings me to, I think, what best surmises the mental state of everyone going into the recording of this album. Dr. Towel, Phil, wrote a mission statement for the band to stand behind, to understand as their guiding light as they create new and innovative music. I went to great pains to get this mission statement, as it's not readily available in most places. (laughs) May I read to you the inspiring words Dr. Towel wrote down and reminded the band of as they began their creative endeavor? I have to insist you never use the phrase Dr. Towel again. Would you prefer Phil Phil Towel, PhD? Yes. Anything but Dr. Towel. Now bear with me because this is sloppy writing. We come now to create our album of life. Throughout our individual and collective journeys, sometimes through pain and conflict, we've discovered the true meaning of family. As we accomplish ultimate togetherness, we become healers of ourselves and the countless who embrace us. And our message, we have learned and we understand, now we must share. If that doesn't scream Saint Anger, (laughs) I don't know what does. With those inspiring words, there were a few other tenets that helped guide Saint Anger's creation that were not typically in play with previous Metallica albums. Let me outline a couple for you. Previously, all most songs were already written either by James or possibly by Lars or the two of them together. They bring their ideas together, sit in a room, orchestrate the song, hand it over to Kirk and say, this is your part. You do this and then you get a solo and then we have another song for you. This time, few things have changed. Everybody gets to contribute an idea equally. So I don't just write the lyrics. You don't just write the lyrics. We all write the lyrics. And, which seems like a... And? Importantly, no one's allowed to criticize anyone's terrible, terrible ideas. Yeah, that part seems like an odd way to make decisions. <laughs> Rule number two, and this is the part where I really did expect to see Kirk Hammett begin openly weeping. No guitar solos. <laughs> Weirdly, in the only place that Kirk Hammett actually makes a good point, having zero guitar solos definitely dates it to the shitty new metal era. Yeah, and the early aughts era right. of music. He nails it. That balding Spaniard's 100% correct. <laughs> he's not balding gracefully either. Here's a tip, and this is a little off topic, but it's it's not if you're Kirk Hammett. If you're balding, and hey, it happens to something like 65% of males by the age of 35, that's cool. Do not grow your hair long on the sides and back as a way to compensate it doesn't in any way distract from the giant balding part if anything it draws a stronger contrast yeah if anything you want to sweep it around the top of your head in some sort of cotton candy-esque manner no one ever notices it's a flawless look I, i think the only other thing i want to say about the production of this album to keep in mind is that as it began in 2001 it would not conclude until sometime in april 2003 which traditionally is about 
five to ten times longer than an album should take ever yeah one other little tidbit is this album also has a non-traditional advisor which is Lars Ulrich's Gandalf of a Father he listens to several of their early demos and his advice is and I quote if I was your advisor I would say delete that to which (laughs) Lars laughs but you can see some pretty heartbroken pain in his eyes oh you see him break inside (laughs) it's It's pretty awesome yeah the only honest guy in the room is like septuagenarian Lars Ulrich's father who's just like ah you know I'm just saying I'm I'm just an old Dutchman but (laughs) that sounds like shit you know who we forgot to talk about the final player in this ridiculous little menagerie Bob Rock Bob Rock yeah that fucking haircut (laughs) you can't discuss this without him so the producer slash co-writer of all of this nonsense is their longtime producer Bob Rock who is very accomplished and and worked on some of their most successful albums. However, this guy, I don't know. It's a real chicken or the egg, Tim. Does this guy genetically look like a giant sack of douches? Or is he <laughs> cultivating that look? I think he's cultivating it. It's just bad. At times, you get the impression that he was constantly maneuvering to remain as the de facto bass player for this garbage album. Absolutely. He at some point mentions, sad. says, I think that Metallica is from here on out just the three of you. I don't think you'll ever find a person permanent bass player. The way the documentary frames it is the next day they went out and auditioned bass players. It does um, seem that way, doesn't and they, it? And they end up with Robert Trujillo from Ozzy Osbourne pseudo fame. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very capable. Yeah, All no, right, he's a great I think bassist. we've set the stage. One more thing oh, that we have to do. So there is a point in this movie where the camera pans over a whiteboard. And on this whiteboard, they've written some ideas for possible album titles for what would eventually become St. Anger. And so I had to pause and write all of those down because, (laughs) Garrett, they're amazing. Because that's your job. That's why we do this, Tim. We do the hard, heavy lifting. Right. Let me start out. So we can all agree St. Anger's a great name. Yes. In fact, the way they describe it is that St. Anger is strong, like iconic strong. And And the person describing that is a record executive and executives (laughs) know what they're talking about right give us the options okay satanic cuckoo clock wow yep surfing the zeitgeist yikes sarcasm with meaning Oh my god. (laughs) Old, ugly, nasty. That might be the best so far, at least. (laughs) Yeah. Then you have best dressed chicken in town. I don't get it, but I like it. (laughs) There's also floods of vomit. Floods of vomit? I think that the number one choice was frantic. But we get to see during yet another tense scene in the movie where two record executives debate the band as to what they should get to call their own album. As you mentioned, the radio executive's defense is, this is way more marketable. Why don't we go with that? That seems easy. (laughs) I don't understand why Metallica, who seems to be holding all of the cards, doesn't just go, we're naming it this, go fuck yourself. (laughs) Let's get into some general thoughts. We've set the stage. Everybody kind of has an idea of the backdrop of the creating of this album. You said you hate it. Why? First of all, this is 11 songs... It's 70, over 75 minutes long. That's a good point. It's, Many of those songs are over seven minutes each. Yes. The shortest song is 514. What the hell, man? Even, made even worse by the fact that we're not dealing with a, an Eminem situation. At least that guy has the courtesy of when he's not just blatantly ripping off other people's music to at least write lyrics. So there's a reason that a song is over six minutes long. Yeah. And especially if you're not going to have any like guitar solos or you're intentionally stripping the music music back what yeah it's literally a two and a half minute song sung three times with a minute intro and that happens repeatedly i I couldn't agree more i wanted to do some math but honestly my calculator couldn't handle it (laughs) if you strip out all the all the instrumental intros that in no way match the songs And then you took out all of the times that the two, three, or six verses have been repeated and only let it play once like a, or even twice like a normal song. I think this album is just shy of 11 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. To me, this album is what would have happened if we all had that friend whose parents fought all the time and then eventually got a divorce. If instead of getting a divorce, those parents were locked in a room and forced to make a heavy metal album. (laughs) Yeah, that is essentially what is happening here. 
every note of this feels begrudging. And I get the feeling that Lars Ulrich was going to play whatever he wanted to play. And he's very good at drums. Holy yeah, shit. Doesn't come off on a lot of this, though. It sounds like he's just like, okay, well, I'm going to play the same drum for 30 seconds straight. And I'm not going to change it up any. Fuck you guys. Yes. Yeah, all of these people in this band are very accomplished musicians. I don't want to hear from anyone, because a lot of times we have bands that we've picked that we don't know. We don't even know if they're talented, because what they're doing is either phlegm scatting or, you know, whisper singing, all of these things that aren't actually singing. I can say fairly confidently, at least in the heavy metal genre, all of these dudes are super good at music. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. What they Unfortunately, one of them is having an existential breakdown. The <laughs> other one's throwing a temper tantrum. And then, as we mentioned, there's the watery-eyed middle yeah, kid who just wants everybody to get along. Yeah, he's in a fetal position in the corner. Lyrically, this band, they have this bizarro Beatles lyric writing thing going on. And what I mean by that is the Beatles have a lot of songs and lyrics that are based around a turn of phrase. You have like a hard day's night, eight days a week, etc. And it's usually like John Lennon writing a song around a weird variation of a common phrase that like Ringo would say. I'm with you so far. So these assholes, they try to do the same thing. However, they're not cheeky Brits. They're trying to be like dark and metal. And so you get things like, I'm in anger with you instead of I'm in love with you. My lifestyle determines my death style. Go with that. So you're addressing something that probably should be covered up top so that we don't become repetitive. Every lyric on this album is the result of there was a date on the calendar this album had to come out when it was due to come out according to the promotion and everything that was behind it the machine that is metallica but when your chief lyric writer is as i've mentioned just a cold babe in the woods newly exposed to a life he doesn't understand (laughs) and constantly being advised by dr towel you're not going to get quality lyrics so (sighs) but the other problem is that they're just like okay hey, everyone gets a lyric on this song. What, what would you, yeah. you know, no one can say no. Everyone gets at least one line. You even find out later that Kirk Hammett wants nothing to do with this process. It's basically Lars is tired of James constantly driving the bus and he wants more of a say. It doesn't end well, Tim. I will I will say this is a good time to bring this up. I am madly in anger with you. <laughs> Rude. A lot of the lyrics on here sound like they were written directly after a- attending AA meetings, which is exactly what was going on. Chicken soup for the metal soul. This is a dude's shitty journal laid bare. And I have a sneaking suspicion that the things that people write just after they stop doing drugs are most often not profound, but rather pithy and sort of embarrassing. Track number one, Frantic. Now, Garrett, it is it is not frantic. It's fran tick 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 talk. It is frantic, tick, 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 talk. The music is fine. Yeah. It is a bad metal album, yeah. but it's fine. It's nothing and spectacular, but it services. Yeah. It, it if moves there had the been somebody, along. sure. If there had been somebody who knew how to write lyrics, you might have even snuck one by people that just like heavy metal. They wouldn't have known the difference. But coming in as somebody that doesn't really have a frame of reference and only knows their best work, this is just embarrassing. So James Hetfield's an older gentleman, and he has gone through a great length uh, to work on his voice as he gets older to make sure he doesn't lose it unfortunately i don't know if he has lost his voice because this song is the first of many that features shout rapping he can't seem to stay in pitch his voice cracks a bunch yeah and and not in a stylistic way no an embarrassing no on a lot of these songs he does this really elongated thing over sort of quiet parts like for this song example he does this keep on searching and just oh my <laughs> god what is that like it, that it can't be right it, it is the vocals they all sound like the guy fieri album we did where they're all like demo vocals that just everyone's like eh fuck it let's not re-record you are very right and i want to i want to focus on that for a second i've never felt more in an album that the vocals were more disconnected from the music being played 
It sounds off. It is a poorly produced album. Look at it, you, Bob Rock. I can't even say that Hetfield's not trying. In the documentary, you get him doing a whole bunch of different takes in this never-ending parade of Hawaiian shirts with a giant herpes lesion on his face. Okay, well, you're, you're making reference to a lot of different things there. Let me unpack that for everyone. Constantly, James is doing vocal exercises, which good for him. Again, he's trying very, very hard to maintain his voice. And I don't don't know if he's never given the chance to sing or if he can't and so all of the songs on this album are just him shouting but his general appearance vacillates between gas station mechanic from the 50s <laughs> which basically kind of looks like the lead singer of a ska band <laughs> yeah and hawaiian shirts with flip-flops and jeans None of this is James Hetfield, none of this is Metallica, and all of it is bewildering. We get more of a thrash feel to it than the most recent Metallica. They describe this as sort of going back to their roots in that sound. But musically, and the internet has bitched about this more than I ever could or think that is probably even fair to the band, but the drums on this sound off as well. It sounds almost like there's this dull snare drum or something. It sounds like it's broken and they just didn't replace it because again who yeah. gives a shit yeah he changed his drums for this album if you listen to guys that are playing like those white buckets on the street as yes. drums for charity like they're all over chicago like most major cities they're getting a better sound out of those than lars is getting out of his drums on this album to me the drums ring the whole time and it drove me crazy it's not good and it's a conscious decision lars made in order to quote unquote innovate but mostly it doesn't work from this very first song and perhaps maybe most evidently in the first song this is a band being held hostage by a broken man the lyrics to this song are terrible it's just baffling that they would put this as the first song he spends a fair amount of time complaining that he's wasted his life could i have my wasted days back would i use them to get back on track but then you have super on track by the way (laughs) if Um, he's off track what am i well again face first into homelessness oh right yeah my life style determines my death style is an early contender for the worst lyric on this album and i hope that's not the case because if so your death is definitely coming at the hands of a meatball sub Um, oh god just like the gypsy woman predicted (laughs) there's also weird kind of buddhist backing vocals birth is pain life is pain death is pain it's all the same oh that's what you mean by buddhist i was just like i don't remember any (laughs) buddhist chants on here yeah buddhist ideals yeah all of these songs have outros that trick you into thinking they're done and then they go on for another minute and a half yeah i wasn't sure what to expect from the first one at this point i was still mildly optimistic okay and then came track two saint anger and i saw that it was over seven minutes long i smashed my phone went to the apple store purchased a new phone downloaded the album and let me just say Seven minutes? <laughs> I don't know why it's a title track, but also I don't know why this is a track. Uh, it starts out with a lot of more out of key, what I can only describe as caterwauling. Um, <laughs> it's so bad. Some lyrics for this. Sane anger around my neck. And then in the background, he screams, you flush it out. You flush it out. Little genius note here. Notice how his voice changes in the song during this line. This is the anger speaking. What? (laughs) You also get, I'm madly in anger with you. It doesn't help that they repeat it over and over and over. This is repeated 16 times. Is it really? Yes. (gasps) Yeah. (laughs) Let's stop right there. 16 times. Let's just make it four and maybe cut this thing down at least under seven minutes. You've got fuck it all and no regrets, which I guess is the metal way of saying YOLO. I like that. (laughs) I don't think anyone's saying that anymore. (laughs) You gotta stop wearing that bedazzled t-shirt when we go places. (laughs) YOLO. Would you like me to wear my fuck it all and no regrets t-shirt? Yes, if it's bedazzled. Either way, I can't go back to that La Madeline, so I don't care what you wear. (laughs) Did you know this song has three different choruses? Uh, Yeah, a couple of them do. I don't think I know what a chorus is. (laughs) I think it's a verse. I think it's just a verse Uh, now. Then what are verses? Also verses. Call them what you want. Doesn't matter. Okay. Track number three. Some kind of monster. These are the eyes that can't see me. These are the hands that drop your trust. These are the boots 
Remember when I was angry about that seven minutes? <laughs> well, track number three is over eight minutes. 825. Okay, so this is not the longest song on this album. Nope. I don't want to hear from you fucking Metallica fans that tell me, Hey dude, they've had fucking long songs since the 80s. I thought you were a fan. First of all, in the 80s, they were songs. They were not just utter nonsense. They had a chorus, they had a bridge, they had verses, they had a guitar solo, and then everybody went home. There was no therapy, there was no Dr. Towel. You know how when you hit a certain age, you gotta take your driving test again? No. Is that a thing? Yes. What? What do you, what? I've never taken a driving test ever. Okay, first of all, do you have a license? I do. After driver's ed, they just gave me a license. There was no that driving was the test. test. No, because I did poorly in driver's head. <laughs> if that was the test, I would not have a license. Anyway, when you hit some old person age, you have to take the test again to prove that you're not going to murder everybody with your Cadillac. No, I, I can't believe that. Maybe it's just an eye exam. <laughs> yeah, Doesn't okay. matter. That's true. Go My ahead. My point, fuckface, I think that all aging musicians after the age of... How old is Jack White? Uh, Like 45, maybe? No. Whatever a, whatever a year before Jack White's age is today, that is the new age that you must submit all future new projects in writing to a board to review whether or not you are still capable of making art. And if not, that's okay. We're not telling you you can't go out and tour, but you're gonna play the hits. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear your new album, Metallica. All I'm saying is we need to put together some sort of board and, you know, they'll review the work and if it's quality, then hey, release it. If not, then they'll be placed on a list, monitored for a certain amount of time, and then when they are deemed no longer a value to society, murdered. I'm sorry. <laughs> I enjoy to your Stalinesque approach to this, and I am I'm on just board. spitballing, Tim. My point is that there comes a point where an artist may not be relevant any longer, and it's better for them, their fans, and honestly, all of us, if they just don't try anymore. Right, so if they were, like, ground up and fed to younger musicians. I'm in right. there. Yeah. So that they could get their strength and power. Yes. Okay, I'm glad we're on the same page. For Let's the record, uh, Jack three. White is 42. Okay, so 41 it is. <laughs> somebody should have stopped that psycho from releasing whatever that is. Stay yeah. tuned for that. I have a question about what a line means. The line is, ominous, I'm in us. What and also why? Yeah, it doesn't match anything in the rest of the song. And then all of a sudden you got a Stephen Hawking alien mm -hmm. uh, robot yeah. just so an ominous... I'm in us. It's my favorite part of the song, don't get me wrong, <laughs> yeah. but it doesn't match any of the rest of it. A lot of these lyrics are very much straight from your local ninth grade goth kids journal. For example, this is the God that ain't so pure. This is the pain that never leaves. These are the screams that pierce your skin. This is the black that uncolors us. This is the toilet that I use daily. Yeah. This is fuck? the brush that combs my hair. <laughs> it is the heavy metal equivalent to Goodnight Moon. <laughs> <laughs> you also have, though, this is the voice of Silence No More. And I just want to say, love him or hate him, Metallica was on the Me Too movement way before no, most bands. That's not what he means. It no, is. No, no, it, no, 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 I think so. He is tired. No, he is you're... standing up for women. He is... It has nothing to do with women. Then let me ask you this, Garrett. Yeah. If not the Me Too uh -huh. movement, what is this song about? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm going to say Me Too movement. Actually, you know what, Tim? I'm glad you asked because I was going to gloss over this. Let me explain what this song is about. It is called Some Kind of Monster, and he lists the various parts that assemble to create the monster. No two parts are matching. When it's completed, it is a, a horrific, unholy mess that no one could ever love or would admit to creating. I submit to you, this is a meta description of this entire album. I like it. Backed up yep. by the fact... Nope, nope, you know what? <laughs> Stop right there, you hit gold, friend. It's an unholy mess. That's what they're referring to. But I just, I know I've said it before, I just want to say it one more time. He fucking raps in this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, Ken, let's not get past that. Anything else you want to say about this pile? Nope. Great, let's move it along. Track number four, Dirty Window. I'm judging, I'm jury, and I'm executioner. This is my favorite song. There, I said it. Controversial. Oh. 
This means nothing to anyone but you and I, but this sounds a lot like a Burden Brothers song to me. That's what it was. Oh. It's, it's not half bad. That's probably part of the reason it's my favorite song. There's crooning in the middle of this. Yeah. Where he sings about being the judge, the jury, and executioner. And I've told you how he doesn't sing in here. Here he does, in fact, sing. And it couldn't stand at odd or contrast. He actually makes maybe a good metaphor, presumably for his horrible alcoholism. But he says, I see my reflection in the window. This window, clean inside, dirty on the out. So basically, people see a shitty person, but he believes himself to be a good person. I think it would actually make for a better song if that had been reversed. I actually reversed it in my head. Then oh. as you started to explain it, I was like, no, you f- stupid fuck. It's backwards. <laughs> nope. He is the stupid fuck. Yes, yes. Can I give you one genius annotation for this? Sure. So the lines are, am I who I think I am? Am I who I think I am? Am I who I think I am? I look out my window and see it's gone wrong. The genius annotation. James is thinking to himself, is he who he thinks he is or wants to be? (laughs) (laughs) I hate you. Okay, he sees his reflection and thinks it, it isn't who he thinks he is. Then somebody named Soap disagrees and offers up an alternative explanation, which is the U.S. sees other countries violating human rights, starting wars, etc., that the U.S. believes they must go in and intervene, even though America does the very same things. It's about past sins. Yes, like- of America. Past sins of America. No, no. Of a single human being. (laughs) There was no mystery. Also, we get more listing. But this time, he does something different with it. Instead of listing things that he sees around or stuff he's doing with his day, he just lists words that rhyme. So you get projector, rejector, infector, injector, defector, ejector. I feel like Bob Rock maybe had a note for him, or, you know, could have come from Dr. Tell, that, you know what, I say that, I don't even know that he was a doctor. He's like a (laughs) life coach slash snake oil salesman. He's definitely not a psychiatrist. He's not an MD. I can't imagine he's an MD. Anyway, Dr. Tell uh, or (laughs) or Bob, I feel like one of them was like, hey, James, we noticed like none of the lyrics rhyme at all. And they don't have to, but when they're that short and monosyllabic, it helps. Uh, (laughs) Totally helps. And so he was like, yeah. And then he went home and he rhymed a bunch of words. (laughs) I should probably also mention so that folks don't get confused. In my brain, James Hetfield can only say variants of yeah, like... uh, your average Groot. <laughs> that's true. He can also only say them between the hours of 12 and 4 because that's the only time he was allowed to work on this album. I'm so glad you brought this up. <laughs> James Hetfield is only allowed to work when he leaves rehab from the hours of 12 to 4. He's on a very strict schedule so that he can exercise and go to his meetings, which all super important. Totally get it. Everyone in the band is very understanding of it. Super willing to accommodate him. Then there's a small problem. <laughs> turns out when James said, hey guys, I can only work from 12 to 4, what he really meant was no one do anything related to the band of Metallica unless it's from 12 to 4 and I'm sitting next to you. (laughs) Which is, you know, wildly ridiculous. I believe that was what led to Lars getting super close to his face and just screaming, fuck! It does. (laughs) So, good for him. It all breaks down when James gets angry that Bob Haircut and Lars were listening to a cut from the previous day at 4.15, to which Lars paces back and forth in what's one of the best scenes of the whole movie, just explaining how insane it is that (laughs) someone would ever ask you to not listen to a recording unless they were present, ending with him saying fuck three times in a row, walking up to James Hetfield's face and screaming fuck in his face till he leaves. Yeah, like an inch away. I I was 90% sure he was leaning in for a kiss. That's how close he gets. Yeah, if he had tilted his head just ever so slightly. (laughs) James might have misinterpreted. Yeah, it's it's awesome. <laughs> might have had a whole different movie. Yeah, I doubt it. Track number five, mm-hmm. Invisible Kid. On this song, there's a line, I'm okay, just go away, into the distance, let me fade. But the way he sings it, it's exactly the same as Blue Oyster Cult's Don't Fear the Reaper. Yes. He does the, I'm okay, just yeah. go away. Yeah, it's it's exact. I agree. As a longtime fan of Metallica, when I listen to this song, I just have to ask myself, how did we get from metal up your ass to open your heart, I'm beating right here? <laughs> 
it should also be pointed out, this is the second of our over eight minute series. Eight minutes, 30 seconds, the same song. I did a little math. It's a two and a half minute song, three times with one intro. <laughs> to take a page out of Punk Rock's book from this thing, if you're going to go back to this thrashy kind of thing, just do like more of a punk thing where it's just these songs are going to be short. They're going to be to the point. We're not going to, if you're not going to dress them up, then don't dress them up. And I I'm willing to compromise, Tim. If you want to make your songs four to six minutes long and make this six album is an hour, it. I'm not asking you to, to <laughs> squeeze blood from a stone. I just don't think eight minutes is reasonable. It's asking a lot. Can we talk about the ooze at the end of this song? <laughs> The whole song is pretty standard heavy metal. And then in the last part of the song, the whole thing changes its feel. And James Hetfield just starts going, Ooh, <laughs> what a good boy you are. Yeah. And he is a good boy. Ooh, okay. what a quiet boy you are. <laughs> I'm so uncomfortable. You gotta stop. All right, I'm done. I'm oh, done. genius. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> See, this is what you do, you silly little bitch. God damn it, man. Yeah, did you not know I was going to do it? Oh, it really right seemed like you. it wasn't going to do it. I'm worried if I start talking again, you're going to do it again. <laughs> that would be fucking <laughs> All right, I'm going to I'm going to choose to trust you here. <laughs> the genius lyrics. Ooh. Okay, God damn it. I'm a little sweaty from my ooze. <laughs> Me too. I don't suppose you. I don't really have anything else for this though. Nobody does including James Hetfield. Let's move it along. Track number 6, My World. First of all, let me point out it's only 5 minutes and 46 seconds. The song starts as a Metallica song. It sounds so much like a Metallica song, I got my hopes up. But then it turns curiously into a Paxil commercial. <laughs> and I'd like to read some lyrics if I may. Why is it raining in my room? Heavy fog got me lost inside. Cheer up, boy. Clouds will move on soon. It's my world now. Paxil. <laughs> or Abilify, if Paxil alone is no longer working for you. <laughs> it's very These strange. These lyrics are so sad. I interpreted, God, it feels like it only rains on me. I just thought that was an Eeyore reference from Winnie the Pooh. Well, is it? Is it not? I don't know how, uh, how up to date you are on your poo history. <laughs> did, did he enjoy thistles or was that just something he had to eat? Because now that I'm an adult, I know what a thistle is and that doesn't seem very delicious. No. I don't remember if it was a treat for him or not. I know that the bear enjoyed honey and that I feel tiger like liked maybe, a good jump. Maybe just a part of his terrible life. Yeah, really okay. an abused... anyway. anyway, yeah. Yeah, so James Hetfield, the Eeyore of the group, before he goes away and he's just living in a world of sadness and, and booze and presumably ladies, starts the song. It's always raining on me. And then he comes back and we get a bunch of recovery nonsense. Cheer up, boy. Clouds will move on soon. <laughs> it's my world now. It's a beautiful morning. <laughs> Fuck you, Metallica. And, How dare you? In all honesty, I kind of thought that part of it sort of works as an ode to female empowerment again. Because you get the... Okay, this one, you know what? I mocked you the first time. <laughs> yeah. I think this time you might be onto right, something. Take me down your path. Gonna sit right back and enjoy this ride. It's my world now. You can't have it. It's my world. It's my time now. Lena Dunham could do worse. Here's the problem. And I want to believe this is about female empowerment. I was... Are you familiar with the hit early 90s show suddenly susan absolutely who of, isn't who isn't right <laughs> of course i was picturing the confident young businesswoman that was susan from the show she's but going out she's taking the world by storm grabbing the bull by the horns so there's a chance that lena dunham approves but let's revisit it when we're further into the album okay. what do you say sure i do want to bring up a couple of things he calls me a sucker if Did i remember correctly I this is it. this is your marty mcfly chicken situation yeah it's it's i'm uh, surprised you didn't try to fight your iphone again <laughs> <laughs> it is a sore sticking point with me. Ever since your mom called you a sucker when
when you were nine. Jesus Christ. To be fair, she got you good, sucker. <laughs> you can go fuck yourself, friend. That's... I'm going to have people on the internet calling me sucker now. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Hey, that's a good time to remind everybody. Get on the old iTunes uh, or wherever you listen to the show. Rate, review, subscribe. And I you know a lot of you have. And if you have, thank you very much. If you don't know what to write, I always like to, to give you a few suggestions. Maybe throw the five stars up there if you want to put Tim's a sucker. That's a great thing to write. Then I know you're listening to the show. It'll mean a lot to both of us. Tim, as you hear, will love it. I don't care uh, for it. Shh, Tim, shut the fuck up. If you don't know what to write, just put in Tim's a sucker. It'll be a little something you and I know. Tim's a sucker and enjoying the show. Maybe you hate the show. Let us know that too. Always looking, but it makes a big difference. So we really do appreciate it. Track number seven, shoot me again. The intro guitar to this sounds a lot like that effect from Rage Against the Machine where they're dragging metal up and down the guitar strings. I believe it's an electric toothbrush. Somebody should have told them they could do it a lot easier with jagged metal. I don't think it was terribly hard. Literally just move a vibrating toothbrush up and down the strings. Do you know what this song is about, Tim? I do. The song Shoot Me Again was inspired by Metallica's dispute with Napster. Metallica had purposefully leaked their song I Disappear, which they made for the movie Mission Impossible 2, only to find out that 2 million people had downloaded it from Napster. The way this reads, Metallica rightfully sued Napster and won the case, shutting down Napster for good. The song is saying that no matter what shots are fired at them, they won't be their downfall. It seemed odd that they would give a shit. I mean, I suppose they thought that it's just going to get worse and worse, and it kind of did. It definitely but did. then again, though, you have to think back to the time. Part of the reason that Napster was so successful is there wasn't a good alternative. Yeah. You couldn't just go to iTunes and well, download sure, shit. sure. If you told my father, even to this day, to rip a CD, <laughs> you like had eight heads. Fuck does that mean? <laughs> He's just fucking ripping CDs in half like phone books. <laughs> <laughs> How does it get on the iPod? <laughs> I know I've mentioned it, but this song is definitely guilty of some rap rock. I'll give you my examples, and then I know you have some lyrics that you found particularly atrocious in this song. Wake the sleeping giant. Wake the beast. Wake the sleeping dog. No, let him sleep. That's the best if that's one not here. white dudes ramping, I don't know what is. It gets a very corn slash limp biscuit thing here. All the shots I take, I spit back at you, yeah. All the shit you fake comes back to haunt you, oh. There are a lot of superfluous mouth noises in this album. It's definitely corn inspired All right, Tim, challenge question for 100 points on the board. Would you rather listen to Corn, Follow the Leader, or Metallica, Saint Anger? Good lord, that's a hard question. I think Corn, just because it was overtly ridiculous enough that I was laughing half the time, this I just Mm -hmm. hate. Yeah, new and old listeners alike. I'd like to introduce a new segment. Before the show started, I asked Tim to pick the song that had the lyrics that drove him the craziest. He has picked track number seven, Shoot Me Again. The reason I had Tim pick a song that had the worst lyrics was, as some of you may recall, I mentioned that a young 16-year-old Garrett was asked as a school project to pick the poetry of our favorite poet to then recite in front of the class. Now, just reciting poetry is a nerve-inducing, difficult exercise that no 16-year-old boy wants to have to do in front of girls he wants to impress. Because I was 16 and an egomaniacal sociopath, rather than picking either a very obvious poet or as many gentlemen did, just a song. And then they read song lyrics. Rather than doing that, I chose to write my own poetry. Whether or not it was written before this exercise is difficult to say. Either way, rather than reading a known poet, I chose to read a personal work to impress a girl in the class while I just stared at her. Right, you wanted to make it clear that you were your favorite poet. Yes, and that the, the poems were about her. Yes. Well... I retell that story because since that episode, (laughs) I have found this book of poetry. (laughs) And to help exemplify just how terrible the lyrics in this album are, (laughs) I will pick one work from this tome to read that best matches the writing styles of the album we're doing this week. I've picked a work called Never Alone in My Thoughts. (laughs) No. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. So <laughs> he 
guys can't see it. There's some sketches on it. It, his notebook, has a f- not an insubstantial amount of blood on it. Listen, I explained the blood. I have had this notebook for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Anything I own for 20 years is going to get a little bloody. <laughs> Tim? Why, bro? I am a, I am a man that bleeds. <laughs> yes? Do you... Do, Oh, okay, hold on. Do you not bleed? I do bleed. Okay, when you bleed, does that blood get on things? Sort of. <laughs> not the way it's gotten on your notebook, though. Okay, you're you're distracting. So for the purposes of this, I have chosen a work that I think will most closely resemble the lyrical stylings of James Hetfield, titled Never Alone, in, <laughs> Never Alone in My Thoughts. I will be replacing all references to she and her with death, <laughs> so that you can see just how close this is to a Metallica song from Saint Anger. Why is it covered in blood? though are you concerned it's not my blood is I'm that the issue concerned well i'm concerned that there's any blood i'm concerned with whose blood it is it is mine i have had it for 20 years when you have objects that long you're bound to get blood on them <laughs> that's not true <laughs> i can't take you through this we're gonna get back to the blood though no we're not okay never alone in my thoughts inside my mind death never leaves me my thoughts of death never stray for a moment so many feelings shall never be shared so many words if only death knew and all we share is a common glance and nothing more shall ever be it's beautiful it was not beautiful. it was beautiful it was better than the lyrics on this album oh absolutely the whole point of this is to <laughs> exemplify just how close a 16 year old me was able to replicate the hard two plus years of work that metallica <laughs> dr towel and producer bob haircut spent creating something of equal or lesser value did she respond the way you thought no death didn't which, appreciate it the way you thought she death should. did not appreciate it <laughs> every time we have lyrics that are childish and high school poetry at best which fans of the show are gonna know that's pretty much every week <laughs> i will read the closest matching poetry what was wrong with me tim <laughs> you were a very sensitive little boy you were well, you were the, the kirk hammett of your school here's the question who was that for i wrote that for somebody to read you wrote that for this moment number eight sweet amber got some lyrics in here wash your back so you don't stab mine (laughs) this was written during a particularly hilarious conference call just so everybody understands where this art's coming from lyrics are literally being pulled out of stodgy conference calls i was really encouraged by the intro guitar and then it just quickly devolves into seek and destroy but seek and destroy as written in 2003 so terrible i do have one genius lyric occasionally genius lyrics says something so confidently that i'm like oh maybe did i not might missing something so i have to look it up this lyric was amber is a prime ingredient in alcoholic oh, beverages. I did see that. Sweet no, Amber is referring to an alcoholic drink of some sort. Now, I should have known the some sort <laughs> is not the most confident of ways to end a sentence, but I moved on and then I kind of stopped and I was like, am I missing something? Is there something called Amber that I'm unaware of? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. It's just a reference to the color. Yes. Fucking genius lyrics this... making me feel like an asshole. Yeah. Song number nine, The Unnamed Feeling. At the very start of this, we get a very corn-like whisper of them saying, been here before. I think this is my least favorite song just because this one really has a new metal feel to it. Yes, I'm glad you pointed that out. This one has everything we hate about a song. It has corn level shouting, corn level whispering. There's definitely a Kid Rock level auto tune in there. This is the first time I've ever noticed a hint of the sweetening on a Metallica album, and it makes me sick. Um, This entire song could easily and possibly would have been better served as an Evanescence duo where you just high, you know, you high James in the chorus where he just harmonizes with whatever her name is. Evanescence? That's not her name. (laughs) That being said, it has my absolute favorite line on this whole album. It is, can't you help me be uncrazy? Did Homer Simpson write that? Like, what the fuck is this? It's so clunky. Also, with the double negative, this means, can you help me be crazy? Can't, no, doesn't it say, can you help me be uncrazy? It's, can't you help me be uncrazy? Oh. I do have a legitimate question about the meaning of a song here. 
And I wait for this train, toes over the line, and then the unnamed feeling, it takes me away. Is the unnamed feeling the train, or is he jumping in front of the I, train? I'm unclear as well. He kind of implies that he's going to kill himself. Right? He could also just be getting on the anxiety train. Yes. The feelings train. <laughs> Garrett, Last once you join me on the no, feelings no, 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 train. No, 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 I am not getting back on the feelings <laughs> train with you. The last time, there was way too much feeling. <laughs> yeah, that's what the train is for. It's a place yeah, where I, you can go to feel. I wildly misunderstood what that train was for. I thought it was going to be way more oh. words oriented. <laughs> well, there are some oh, words. Hand words. <laughs> Speaking of. Okay. <laughs> I, I do have some more lyrics from this song, and it's always fun when I learn a new new hip slang. See if you can pick out the term that I'd never heard before. I rage, I glaze, I hurt, I hate. I'll read it one more time for those of you who weren't quite ready. I rage, I glaze, I hurt, I hate. It is glaze. Is that a thing? Are we saying that? This whole song's about insomnia, I think. Yes, we'll just say yes. He's trying to get to sleep, and he's angry about it, and then and then he glazes. <laughs> and then perhaps he glazed too many times, thinking that, well, that first glazing didn't quite tucker me out, and it's 3 a.m., perhaps a second glazing is in order. I'm uncomfortable. And then, then comes the hurt, because he's overglazed. <laughs> and he hates himself a little bit. You know what? I'm glad we pulled this thing apart. All right. Song number 10, Purify. Presumably a song about recovering from alcoholism. Boy, it's a good thing they got one of those on here because <laughs> there just hasn't been enough recovery talk. This has the lyrics, peeling back the skin, ghost white, ultra clean, want to be a skeleton. The genius annotation here, the singer wants to be as clean as a skeleton, so what the fuck does that mean? Uh, I am 100% certain if you rip off my meat and pull, <laughs> pull so out unclean. my skeleton, it will that thing's have filthy. about as much blood on it as your terrifying notebook. Listen, Listen, people can't see the notebook, Tim. Yeah. It's just the edges have some blood on There's... them. There's... Okay, anyway. Have you ever heard the expression blood, sweat, and tears? Yes. That's what's covering this notebook. There's sweat and tears on it, too? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. Just I was a 16-year-old boy full of emotions. I was on the is feelings it, let me, train. Let me ask alone. you this. Let me ask you this. How much glaze is on that? Is it I none? I answer Is it questions. none? It, you just answer me, is it none? I'm not on fucking trial here. I don't have to talk about how much this has been glazed. The singer wants to be clean as a skeleton. You know, <laughs> that classic metaphor. I want to be able to eat off that skeleton. Song number 11, All Within My Hands. You get to the end of the album, you've got one song to go, you pray, maybe it'll be a reasonable length, like five and a half minutes. (laughs) No, it's eight minutes and 45 seconds long. That is a third of the last album we did. This song's about being an abusive asshole. Am I reading it is correctly? It? Love to death, smack you around, let you run, then I pull your leash. Love is control. He says love is control a bunch. Yeah, he does. And I mean, I guess I can't complain too much. The Beatles had, I used to be cruel to my woman. I beat her and kept her away from the things that she loved. But Lena Dunham, I don't think, would be on board with this. Boy, you know what? We almost made it. We almost made it. We got 10 of the 11 11- songs, I would have said, does Lena Dunham approve? And I would have given you a tentative yes. Knowing her the way that I know her, the way that you know her, you can't honestly sit there and say that she'd approve of this, can you? No. Love is control? Absolutely not. No. Love is freedom, Tim. (laughs) Hashtag love is freedom. Hashtag feeling strain. (laughs) Uh, Can we say confidently Lena Dunham does not approve of this album? With this song on here, can't. Absolutely not. The outro on this song is yeah. James yelling kill 38 times in a row. So, I'm of two minds on this. Well, first of all, I think we owe Rage Against the Machine an apology. For the plagiarism? No, we as a podcast. Oh, you and I? Yeah. That's fair. Because we did get, we got up their shorts a little bit for, for saying kill, what, 12 times? I said I was of two minds on this. The only reason is, yes, if you're going to repeat anything in a song 38 times, I don't care what it is. That's too many. I would argue 11 is too many. <laughs> 
Yes. And this is 38. 10 which perfect, is, 11 too many. However, it might be the most authentic part of the album for me. Yeah, I, I'll give you I that. believed those kills. <laughs> On the 2007 Bridge School Benefit, there is an uh-huh. acoustic rearranged version of this, which transforms it into this almost sad contemplative song about being just a terrible, broken, codependent person. And it, it honestly, it kind of works like that. It's not bad. Do you have anything more for this? No. We're done. This is clearly a management pushed album squeezed out by three and a half guys and a doctor and we don't know whether or not he is or is not a doctor that's completely for the purposes of making money did it how did this album do it did very well overall it did hit number one on the billboard 200 but it also hit number one in over 30 other countries jesus yes. christ now, it only made it to number two on the dutch mega charts if you which, mention the which, fucking dutch listen as we have seen numerous times on this podcast those are often the most telling for actual quality they are not <laughs> this album went to, uh two times platinum in the u.s so it sold two million copies god damn it, it. sold six million worldwide Saint Anger, the song, also won a Grammy for Best Metal Performance. Uh, yeah, sold 417,000 copies in the first week. Do you know, Tim, just how many albums Metallica has sold to date worldwide? Because I do. I don't. 110 million. Oh, getting close to Garth. Yeah, coming up on those Garth numbers. You want to know what critics thought of this? Oh, I'm dying to know, Tim. Overall, weirdly positive. What? Yeah, Metacritic aggregate score was 65 out of 100. Yeah, I think that's like a B plus on their scale. Yeah. Entertainment Weekly gave it a B plus. NME gave it a 9 out of 10. Rolling oh Stone God. gave it 4 out of 5 stars. Fuck you, Rolling Stone. Pitchfork gave it a 0.8 out of 10. <laughs> Hitchfork! Um, Those guys get it. Yeah, but Spin gave it an 8 out of 10. Everyone seemed to kind of like this when it came out. That's crazy. Yeah. This album had a shit ton of reviews on Amazon. This had 3,393 reviews when I checked. However, yeah. it's also the lowest rated album we've ever done. This got a 3 out of 5 stars. Wow. Yeah. More telling, it got 26% 5 stars, but 36% 1 stars. The hmm. internet kind of got one right. Wow, that's amazing. I have two reviews. The first one is by Mr. W. It was written in 2004, and it is entitled Saint Vomit. Go ahead. Saint Vomit. So it's clearly positive. When I first heard this CD, I gave it a rave review. Well, that was because I was in denial. Since then, I listened to it a second time, and after hearing it throughly, my apologies go out to all of the people who took my advice on this piece of crap. Poor excuse for an album. The vocals are the worst. I've heard Fighting Cats sound more melodic than MC Hetz, and then in parentheses, that would be my new nickname for Trentalica's James Hetfield. No guitar solos. WTF, Kurt. Preload albums may not have had the best guitar solos, but at least they were there. The snare drum. Hey, <laughs> Lars is a cheap guy, so I guess his real snare must have broke, and instead of buying a new one, he brought in a trash can or something. If you love <laughs> the sounds of cats brawling near a trash can, then this album is for you. But if you like Ride the Lightning or Kill Em All, don't even bother. Wow, this guy nailed it. <laughs> this next review has a lot of built-in dramatic pauses that are the author's, not mine. Okay. So it might seem like I'm done, but just... Just give it a minute. I want to really do it justice. This is the title. Saint Anger is a meat and potato saucy grit of the beyond. A mystical trip through pain, suffering, and anger. Love it. This was written by James Hetfield. <laughs> this was written by Gene D in 2017. This album was met with a lot of opposition and criticism. But if you listen to it with an open ear and mind, there is nothing like it out there. Also, the lyrics are by far some of Hetfield's best. They're (laughs) full of self-awareness, introspection, and evaluation. Metallica had been to the moon and back, so now they did what any true, pure artists do. They stepped out of their comfort zone. The goal of the album was to take the biggest heavy metal slash hard rock act today to go back to the basics and play with their art. At the risk of sounding cliche, it's a tour de force of avant-garde intensity (laughs) with deep introspective movement. From the hollow pang 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 of Ulrich's snare to the gravel belted (laughs) lyrics that are not pretty, not perfect, not what anyone would or even better could expect to the absence of solos. You're always thinking and questioning. That is art. That is good that is good art they (laughs) they made millions of fans ask what the hell are they doing 
That is okay. Where does it say that everything in life should be what you expect? And that's what made the greats like Picasso, Van Gogh, Monet, Manet, Kahlo, O'Keefe capture the minds of those who desired more from life and art. Take the plunge, get this album, oh. listen to it, then walk away, then come back to it again and again. <laughs> then have a sandwich. <laughs> then call your mom. It's been a while. Our needs are often met by what we don't recognize. Saint Anger is a medicine for the thinking individual, and it rocks deeply. Like the ocean is vast. So is this oh stab God. at the facade of conformity. That person's not stupid. No, they're just insane. Here's what's weird, is they called out everything that's wrong with <laughs> yeah. the album. And everything and that the listed previous... listed it as a strength. Right. All right, Tim. It's not really for me or you. Who is this for? I don't really know. I guess it's for people that love Metallica, but really didn't like what was good about Metallica. It's for nobody. <laughs> yeah, it really is for nobody. I, I'll tell you who it's not for. Animals. My dog hates it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Yeah, Batman runs out of the room every time I every time I put on this album, he ran from the room. Would you recommend anything instead of this? If somebody was like, well, Good I was really question. excited about that new Metallica album, but I'm hearing from you guys it's not very good. One through five, man. Yeah. You five uh, and guess what? Those albums are not short either. And I would actually say that there are quality Metallica songs that anyone could enjoy. Yes. Honestly, if you don't like heavy metal metal they have a unplugged album golden unplugged or something like that yeah. that you know or you know what the documentary some kind of monster you can hear this album in the way it was meant to be heard yes you get to watch a band make a huge mistake. <laughs> okay, Tim, any final thoughts on this album? <gasps> they were trying. I can't say they weren't trying. They just... They it, tried so hard. It, you can't make an album just because it's time to make an album. That's the real problem. It sounds very forced throughout the whole thing. It sounds like Metallica is doing an impression of Metallica. Definitely can't recommend this album. Highly recommend the accompanying documentary. Anything else, Tim? No, uh, other than to ask, do you, do you hate this, Garrett? Like, I know the answer, but... This one wasn't even fun. I just hate it. So you hate okay. it? Okay. I hate it. Most of uh, the internet seems to have hated well. it. Lars Ulrich's father didn't care for it much. <laughs> All right. This has been Why I Hate This Album. I am one of your hosts, Garrett Harvey. I'm the other, Tim Richardson. The riffs are too repetitive. The lyrics make no sense. All the songs are B-sides and the cover art's a mess. There's so much here to tear apart. Listen to it for a week. Now that we pass past, why I hate this album podcast with Tim and Garrett.